Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 26 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the mysterious disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. I want to remind folks that, as we mentioned the last time, there's a new Mysterious World bookstore at sqpn.com slash mysterious. If you go check it out, we have links to all of the books and other uh, materials that are available for purchase that, that Jimmy mentions during the show. They'll all be linked there in one place. Makes it nice and easy and convenient for you to find it there. Uh, so go check that out. Really, we appreciate it if you, uh, when you when you purchase from there. That helps SQPN and the show uh, as, we, uh, as we, we go forward and continue producing new episodes. So um, this week, as I mentioned, we're talking about the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa. So in the 60s and 70s, Jimmy Hoffa was one of the most famous men in America. Uh, he was always in the news, uh, constantly in the news. And, uh, you know, in his own day, he was as famous as Elvis and the Beatles. Uh, not quite, a, didn't sell as many records as those guys, but uh, was as famous in his own way. Then on July 30th, 1975, he was seen dining at a restaurant in Detroit, Michigan, and then was never seen again. And so his disappearance is a mystery that has never been officially solved, despite, you know, very intensive investigations by the authorities. So we actually do have a good idea what happened, as Jimmy will tell us about, and who was responsible, because one of the people the authorities suspect to have been involved in his disappearance made a deathbed confession. And that's what we'll be talking about today on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So first, Jimmy, for those who aren't familiar, who is Jimmy Hoffa? Yeah, um, a lot of people don't know about him today, but he was very famous. I remember uh, his disappearance being on the news back in the 1970s when it happened, and he he really was hugely famous. Um, he was born in 1913 in Brazil, Brazil, <laughs> Indiana, Brazil, Indiana. That's where he's from. And he became a very prominent trade union leader. Uh, in 1957, he became president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Uh, the Teamsters is a union that began in the transportation industry. Originally, a Teamster was a man who worked with a team of animals to pull a wagon and deliver goods to market. And today, the term is associated with truck drivers who you know help keep America's economy moving. Uh, today, the Teamsters union includes many people in related divisions, uh, that also play an important part in America's economy. At its peak during the Hoffa years, uh, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters had 2.3 million members, and it was the largest union in the United States. So this is why Jimmy Hoffa was so famous. He, he, he His actions had an impact on the lives of millions of people directly, you know, the union members and their families, as well as more broadly in society. And so he was always involved in uh, government things, uh, which we'll talk about. And uh, that brought him to public attention because he would be investigated by, for example, Robert Kennedy. Um, the attorney and, general. Yeah. The, yeah. And even yeah. before he was attorney general, yeah. um, he would deal, had various legal matters. And so he was in the public spotlight a lot. One of the reasons for that is he made deals with organized crime. Now, his defenders will say he had to do that because of the influence that the mob had on labor at the time. Um, <clears throat> that there was just no way Hoffa could have been the head of this major union without some kind of, of dealings with the mafia. One of the things that he did was he used the Teamsters pension fund so to pay for the retirements of their members. He used the te Teamsters pension fund as a kind of private bank to make loans to mob figures. And in particular, one of the things they would do with these loans is build casinos, because at the time, casinos were not the well-established businesses that they are now. Uh, this was at an earlier stage in the development of Las Vegas. And banks 
regular banks frequently wouldn't uh, wouldn't give loans for casinos. They were viewed as like too risky and so forth. And so he would uh, Hoffa would use the Teamsters pension fund to make loans, which would then get paid back with a profit. Uh, but this in 1957 led to congressional investigations. Uh, which led Bobby Kennedy, who was then a young attorney assisting the the McClellan Commission in the Senate, to interact with Hoffa, and he really took a dislike to Hoffa. Um, and then in 1961, when his brother John Kennedy gets elected president, Robert Kennedy becomes Attorney General, and he doesn't drop his vendetta with Hoffa. Instead. He sets up a special squad in the Justice Department called the Get Hoffa Squad. <laughs> so he really had it in for Jimmy Hoffa. Um, <clears throat> and not all of Hoffa's legal troubles came from Robert Kennedy. He also uh, had a variety of issues he was dealing with. And in 1964, he was convicted in Chattanooga, Tennessee, of attempting to bribe a juror. He was he was on trial there and he tried to bribe a juror and they convicted him for it in Chicago. He was also convicted of fraud and of the improper use of the pension fund. He remained out on appeal for a number of years, but in 1967, he went to jail and he appointed a man named Frank Fitzsimmons as his temporary replacement as the head of the Teamsters. He thought that Fitzsimmons was um, basically a man who he could control, and he thought, once I'm out of jail, Fitzsimmons will step back and I'll become president of the Teamsters again, and he thought that, that Fitzsimmons would be willing to do that for him. But it didn't end, out, end up that way. In 1971, Nixon commuted Hoffa's sentence, which by some strange coincidence, also the Teamsters then turned around and endorsed <laughs> Nixon for president in the 1972 election. <laughs> um, but the 1971 commutation required, it had a clause in it that required that Hoffa stay out of labor management until 1980. Mm. Uh, this clause was apparently put in at Fitzsimmons' request, although Fitzsimmons didn't admit to that. And there's some... Um, debate. Apparently, John Dean and Chuck Colson were both involved in including this clause. And there's some debate about exactly what happened. Hoffa, it publicly said that, you know, they were responsible for it and that um, and, and there is evidence that, that they were involved in getting the clause put into the contract. But he uh, challenged it. He said he, his argument was, look, the president can commute my sentence. He can he can pardon me. He can commute it. But he can't add post release conditions right. like this. And and so even though that claim has some surface plausibility, Hoffa ended up losing in court. So the courts didn't uh didn't uh buy that ultimately. But he began working to reclaim the leadership of the Teamsters. Uh and in the process of doing that. He started to talk about how upon becoming president of the Teamsters again, he would expose Frank Fitzsimmons's involvement with the mob as the president of the Teamsters. Because, of course, the mob relations had not stopped. Right. And so he's saying, now I need to get in there to clean things up and I'm going to expose all the mob stuff that Frank Fitzsimmons has been doing. <laughs> That's 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 called hubris. <laughs> that makes sense. It's also called hypocrisy. Yes. But yeah. Um but you can just imagine how some people might have that might have sounded really great to them. Let's expose what the mob is doing. Right. But you know who it wouldn't sound great to? <laughs> Certainly the mob. <laughs> the mob. Yeah. And um and so on July thirtieth, nineteen seventy five, uh Hoffa was go he, he, he was going to a restaurant called the Red Fox in Bloomfield Township, which is a suburb of Detroit. And he was going there to meet mafia leaders. Uh, he was going to meet two of them, Anthony Giacalone, known as Tony Jock, and Anthony Provenzano, known as Tony Pro. And um, 
he was apparently going there to like smooth over their feathers and say, don't worry about this or whatever. He, um, he then vanished. And so hmm. that brings us to the, the claims and counterclaims section of our discussion. Pretty much everybody concluded that Hoffa became the victim of a mob hit. I mean, okay. they, they were the obvious ones right. who would want him dead. And so everybody very quickly concluded that the mob had done a hit on him. But his body was never found. And so that led to uh, key questions involving who was involved and what happened to the body. According to a popular theory, he was buried in the end zone of Giant <laughs> Stadium. Which was being built at the time, uh, presumably, around that time. Right, yeah. Um, according to other theories, he was buried in a number of locations around Detroit. And according to the mafia contract killer, Richard Kuklinski, the body, this is a really interesting one, the body was placed in a 50-gallon drum, set on fire, and sealed. It was then buried in a jump junkyard, dug up, put in a car trunk, and the car was compacted into a cube and sent to Japan for recycling. <laughs> so that's what that's what Kuklinski says he was told. Okay. Uh, so by the way, the, the for those who don't know, the Giant Stadium is in is outside of New York and it's actually technically northern New Jersey. Um, so that would be a long way to go from Detroit to right. dispose of the body. Okay. It, it would be a long way. Okay. So the, the, let's. There's probably, I'm going to guess here, that there's not much in the way of a, a faith perspective. So we'll get to that in a bit. But from the reason perspective, can you look at the mm -hmm. the, the different uh, bits of evidence and the, and what's come out in the history and kind of explore well, then what did happen? Yeah. So the Detroit FBI kind of took the lead on this, and they prepared an extensive set of files on the case. Some of those have actually been released. And in the show notes, we'll have a uh, a link to what's called the Hoffex memo, which was an early FBI document that they prepared. is a really lengthy one, but an early FBI document they prepared that's subsequently been released. In these documents, the FBI named the key individuals they believe to have been involved in one way or another. Uh, they had a certain set of, of mafia figures. They said, we think these are the guys. And the former head of uh, the FBI's investigation has even said that they basically solved the case. They just couldn't prove it. And right. so they think they know they think they know who did what. They just couldn't prove it in court. And so the figures were never prosecuted for the murder of Jimmy Hoffa. But uh, they were punished. They were all punished for other crimes. So they didn't get off scot-free. Um, it's kind of like and this analogy was drawn at the time, uh, you know, how originally the uh, the FBI or law enforcement couldn't get, um, oh, and I'm blanking on his name now. Al Capone. Mobster. Al Capone. Yep. They couldn't get Al Capone on, 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 uh, on, R racketeering. What he was, yeah. on racketeering and what he was actually guilty yeah. of, uh, rum running and things like that. Uh, but they could get him on tax evasion. Yes. And so the argument is we couldn't get these guys for the murder of Jimmy Hoffa, but we got them on other things. And they haven't closed the case because they're even though a, a few of the people are at least one of them is seems seems to be still alive, but is off the radar um, because they just couldn't prove it in court. OK, now various claims have been able to be falsified, though. One of them is the giant stadium claim. Uh, Giant Stadium, uh, the relevant area was uh, was dug up in the year 2010, and his body was not there. Some of them, like the Japan car into cube theory, are unfalsifiable. No way to disprove. There's no way you, you could you can't sort through all the car cubes in Japan, <laughs> <laughs> um, especially after they've been melted down. Right. But there is one very plausible account. Because of what happened, because one of the FBI's key suspects later confessed. Hmm. Okay. And uh, and who is who is that? Who who is the the suspect who actually so confessed? He's he's a figure named Frank Sheeran, 
He's known as Frank the Irishman Sheeran. Okay. And his story is told in a book called I Heard You Paint Houses. Uh, the author of that book is Charles Brandt. Charles Brandt is a is a is a quite reputable figure. He's had a history in in uh, in law and um, and he contacted. He's known as being a very skilled interrogator, and he was able to get a relationship going with Frank Sheeran. And over a number of years, Frank Sheeran gradually disclosed more and more that then on both on uh, on video and and, and audio. Some a lot of this is recorded. And it became the basis of the book, I Heard You Paint Houses. So who Sheeran was, um, he was an American and of Irish ancestry. And after World War II, when he served in World War II, after World War II, he began working as a trucker. Uh, so he was a teamster. And he was taken under the wing of a mafia boss named Russell Buffalino. And, you know, during the war, he killed people including in some situations that would be classified as war crimes. And so he was willing to take life in a broader range of circumstances than a normal soldier. And so he began to work as a hitman hmm. for the mafia. Um, and it's interesting in the book, in I Heard You Paint Houses, how they talk about it whenever he is... Whenever we're at a scene where he's talking about killing someone, they they'll walk right up to the moment of the killing and then they suddenly use circumlocutions because obviously at the time, uh, Sheeran was still alive and he could be prosecuted right. if he admitted to a murder. And so with and Charles Brandt having a background in law helped find ways for him to say things without it technically being a legal admission of guilt. Right. And so you'll read scenes. It's absolutely fascinating the way they do this. You'll read scenes where he'll say, I went into the bar to where this figure that I had been ordered to hit was. And I walked up to the bar after seeing them at the table. And then I turned around and the chauffeur was shot in the back of the head. <laughs> and the and the figure, the, the mobster in question began to run and he got this far and then he was also shot. Interesting. I, 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 I'm not laughing at the fact that these people got killed, but just at the, the, uh, the, the, the language, the, the legal, yeah, the legal uh, uh, twisting of the language to uh, very clever. Um, right. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Now, I don't know that now this, he was a really old man at the time, so they never tested this in court. I personally have some doubts about whether this kind of language would be sufficient. I think a jury could look at that and say, you admitted it, whether you didn't say it that way or not. Right, right. Um, but uh, but in any event, um, Sheeran became a friend of Jimmy Hoffa. Russell Buffalino introduced the two of them. And the title of the book, I Heard You Paint Houses, were Hoffa's first words to Sheeran when they were talking over the telephone. Painting a house is mafia slang for killing someone. Huh. Paint is blood. I gotcha. So the image is you take someone into a house, you shoot them. That's the paint. Right. Um, Hoff, uh, Sheeran's response to Hoffa was, I also do my own carpentry. Meaning I build the coffin, which is a metaphor for building coffins and thus meaning I also dispose of bodies. Wow. Okay. And so it's more circumlocution. Like if you're going to say this over a telephone that the FBI could have tapped. Right. Um, that's why they're using this kind of jargon. Wow. Um, Hoffa then began to help uh, Sheeran's career, and he helped him become a high official in the Teamsters Union. And there's a lot of interesting stuff in the book, but, of course, the core of it is the part that deals with the hit on Jimmy Hoffa. Basically, when... Um, when Hoffa began trying to recapture the presidency of the Teamsters and started saying, I'm going to expose all this mafia involvement, a number of mob bosses became very alarmed and they, they, they said, you know, to various people, including Sheeran, explain it to Jimmy what it is, meaning here are the facts. Right. Either you stop this or you're going to die. And so Sheeran himself had been told to explain to Jimmy what it is, and he did. 
Uh, he said, you know, there are these guys, they're really concerned, really need to back off. And Hoffa brushed it off. He said, they're never going to do anything to me. They are, I've got too much information in, in case of my death files mm -hmm. that will be released. And, um, and so they wouldn't dare touch me. And so he thought it was possible for him to get through this situation. And he was willing to talk to them to try to talk them through the situation, smooth over ruffled feathers while also making it clear that you don't want to touch me. Um, well, Hoffa repeatedly ignored these warnings. And eventually, Sheeran was chosen to be the one to do the hit. Um, the reason that he was chosen was because he was such a friend of Hoffa's. He therefore could get close to Hoffa. Hoffa would not be suspecting that Sheeran would be the one to do this. And basically, um, Sheeran, it, Sheeran says he didn't have a choice, that uh, if, um, if he had refused, he would have gone to Australia with Jimmy. <laughs> going to Australia, meaning going down under, right. he would have been killed too. So this was an offer he could not refuse. Um, they then walk through how they arranged Sheeran's alibi. And it's, it's, it's quite interesting how they did it. Um, basically, Russell Buffalino, um, Sheeran's original mentor, and Sheeran and their wives um, were on a trip together. They were on a road trip, and they, they left the wives at a restaurant like three hours away from Detroit. So you couldn't get there by car in under three hours. And uh, the wives, they left them there to, to eat and drink and smoke cigarettes while the uh, men went off to conduct business. And for Sheeran, what that means is he got in a helicopter, the pilot of whom knew not to look him in the face. They flew him over the lake to Detroit, dropped him off. Uh, he, then, uh, he then got a car um, that had been provided for him. It was someone's car that had been temporarily stolen just for this occasion. Um, he, um, he then drove it to a nearby house um, and made connections there. And then he drove to the, to the Red Fox restaurant with two other guys. One of them was sort of, He's not his legal son, but sort of um, Hoffa's godson was a guy named Chucky O'Brien, sort of a kind of unofficial stepson. And so another person that Hoffa would trust. And, um, and Chucky O'Brien drove his car with uh, Frank Sheeran in it and another man who was there to watch and make sure that this all went down. And they drove to the Red Fox and they told Hoffa that the meeting had been relocated. Now, at this point, Hoffa is fit to be tied. Um, not literally because they didn't tie him up, but he's, <laughs> he's, he's fit to be tied because he's been waiting at this restaurant for these figures that were supposed to show up and didn't. He's been calling his wife and his assistant and complaining that he's been stood up. And um, he's really mad. And this was deliberate. They they were trying to psych him into this particular situation. And Sheeran describes the psychological aspects of the setup in a lot of detail. But they um, they told him that in addition to Tony Jack and Tony Pro, Russell Buffalino was going to be at this meeting. And that's why they need to do it at this house, because Russell Buffalino does not know the Red Fox restaurant. It's not a place he's used to going, so he doesn't trust going there in public. He only wants to meet in private. And because um, Chucky O'Brien, Hoffa's godson, is there, or stepson kind of person, and because his friend Frank Sheeran is there, he trusts them. And so he gets into Chucky O'Brien's car, and, uh, and they, uh, they take him back to the house. And incidentally, um, according to Sheeran, he thinks Chucky O'Brien was a total dupe in this. Okay. Um, he, he thinks Chucky O'Brien had no idea what was going on. He thought that the meeting story was real. Okay. Um, and so he doesn't think Chucky had any knowledge of the hit. Um, but then they take him back to the house. Chucky and the other man leave. 
And the pretext for that is they're not important enough to be at a meeting of this level. Right. Um, but it's also part of compartmentalization because one of the things they make clear in this book is these actions are compartmentalized in such a way that every person only knows a piece of it. That way, if you get hauled into court, you can't testify to things you didn't see because hearsay can be struck, at least in many circumstances. Right. So ch since Chucky and the other guy don't go into the house, they don't know what happened from that point. Okay. In the house are two cleaners. A cleaner, in mob jargon, is a person who disposes of bodies and cleans up crime scenes. Right. There are two cleaners in the house, but they are in a back room. So they do not see the hit either. That's their compartmentalization. So they could say, hey, we heard gunshots. We came out. We found this body. We did this with the body, but we don't know who shot him. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the cleaners are back there and nobody else is. Sheeran then escorts Hoffa into the house. And Jimmy Hoffa is this like, he's kind of a self-important guy. He's walking out front. He walks into the house with Sheeran behind him. Nobody's in the house. As soon as he sees nobody's in the house, he knows something is desperately wrong. This is going to be a hit. Mm. But he thinks Sheeran is on his side. He thinks Sheeran is there as his protection. And so he turns around and he kind of he starts to go out the front door, but he bumps into Sheeran because Sheeran's behind him. And he gets around Sheeran and gets as far as the door. And then I'm going to read a direct quote from the book. According to Sheeran, he reached for the knob and Jimmy Hoffa got shot twice at a decent range, not too close or the paint splatters back at you. In the back of the head, right behind his ear, my friend didn't suffer. Hmm. So that's the circumlocution he uses. He says right. Jimmy Hoffa was shot in the back of the head twice when he was at, reaching for the doorknob and he didn't suffer. But, of course, we've established that there was no one else in the house except for the cleaners in the back room. Except for the cleaners in the back room, right. Um, Sheeran then leaves. He goes back to the airport, drops off the stolen car. The pilot, again, does not look him in the face, flies him back over the lake to the restaurant that's three hours away by car. This has all taken less than three hours. Mm -hmm. So the wives could say, oh, no, he went for some business, but he couldn't have driven to Detroit in that time. Right. Um, and the cleaners then take the body and deal with it, which is their part of the job. Sheeran says he was told now, of course, he's compartmentalized on how the body was disposed of. He doesn't know. He just knows what he's been told. He was told it was cremated, which is why it was not found. And there may be an extra layer of compartmentalization in there because Sheeran, or at least different disinformation, because Sheeran was initially told it was cremated at one place. But then later, he was told it was cremated at a local funeral parlor where they do cremations um, that had mob associations. Mm. So that's that's Sheeran's claims in I Heard You Paint Houses. OK, so um, so how do we evaluate what Sheeran claims? I mean, did, is he telling the truth um, is he or is he just self aggrandizing? How do we evaluate uh, any of this? Yeah, I, I whenever I hear a confession story like this, I always put on my skeptic hat because there are lots of people who confess to crimes for reasons of self-aggrandizement or yeah. mental illness. Um, right. And I mean, like loads of people have confessed to the JFK assassination. And so anytime there's a famous crime like this, probably more people are going to confess to it than actually did it. <laughs> right. And and so you have to look for signs of, is this guy credible or not? In Sheeran's case, now, I think his story is entirely plausible. All of the decisions make sense. There's nothing mm -hmm. there that leaps out and screams, this is implausible. Okay. So then we look at the guy himself and the circumstances under which he made this confession. The first thing is he is reluctant to do this. He just doesn't come out and say this on his own. Um, the author of the book, uh, Charles Brandt, has to kind of coax it out of him a little bit at a time over a period of many years. Like I think they had like a six-year relationship. Mm -hmm. um, he also doesn't do it until he's on his deathbed. He's, he's quite old at this point. And even in the book, 
he doesn't directly say it. But he did directly say it when he was closer to death. So even after the book was, the manuscript was in preparation, um, he he went on to continue talking to Brandt. And uh, we're going to hear a clip now where Sheeran actually does admit firing the gun in a direct, straight out way. Uh, so here's a clip of Charles Brandt after the interviews that were in the book, interviewing uh, Frank Sheeran about this. How many shots were fired at Jimmy? Two. You were the shooter. That's right. Yeah, so there he directly admits it. He said there were two shots, and he says, I, I, that's right, I was the shooter. He also, in the book, expresses regret at having done this. Uh, it's not like he hated, secretly hated Jimmy or anything like that. I mean, he's his friend, and he expresses remorse over having done this, but he feels like he didn't have a choice. And that, I think, also is a, is a motive of credibility here. Um, if he were just doing this for self-aggrandizement, you're kind of diminishing yourself. You're not just aggrandizing yourself. If you're saying, I killed my friend and I'm really sorry I had to do it, but I did. You know, that's not, mm -hmm. look at me how glorious I am. Also, there is some external evidence. Uh, one of the things they found in Chucky, o in the backseat of Chucky O'Brien's car was a hair. And this hair had a follicle on it that could be DNA tested, even after all these years. Hmm. And it was Jimmy Hoffa's DNA. So they found one of Hoffa's hairs in Chucky O'Brien's car. Also, uh, Sheeran was able, even all these decades later, because it's like thir 30 years later when he's talking to Brand, he was able to remember where the house was. This happened. And he took Sheeran or he took Brandt to the house. And they didn't go inside. It, you know, it had new owners and stuff. Um, but later on, after after uh, Sheeran died, Brandt did get access to the house. And, and one of the things he thought when he first accessed the house was, okay, a bunch of this matches the description of the interior of the house that Sheeran gave me, except for this one thing. Sheeran said that there was a back door, like out of the kitchen, mm -hmm. and there wasn't. And so he talked to the house owner about that, and the house owner said, "Oh yeah, there was one. We took it out when we remodeled." Huh. And so that bit of the description also fit, even though if let's say Sheeran had scoped out this house recently, he wouldn't yep. have known about the door. Okay. So it's evidence yep. he had knowledge of the house from back then. Also. They So there's this chemical called luminol, and what luminol does is it binds to the iron in your blood, and it makes it glow. And so luminol is used at crime scenes to detect the presence of blood. So um, after the claims got made regarding this is the house where Jimmy Hoffa was killed, they did luminol testing in the house, and they found a blood trail that mm -hmm. matches the description that uh, that uh, Sheeran had provided of how Jimmy Hoffa's body was disposed of. Be because um, blood is extremely persistent against even regular cleaning. You'd have to yes. do intensive cleaning to get rid of blood evidence. In a right. I I've watched right. C uh, lots of CSI. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, yeah, so he had said Jimmy Hoffa's body was dragged down the hall and out the back door, and that's what the blood trail indicated. Okay. So, So then the next question is, can we have... DNA evidence. Well, the problem is blood DNA doesn't hold up well when exposed to the elements over a period of 30 years. Mm. So, um, so some people have said it's not going to be possible at the present state of DNA testing to recover enough testable DNA to be able to do that. But they have tried. Um, a lot of the samples they took didn't show any preserved DNA. Um, one of them did show a man's DNA, but it wasn't Hoffa's. But that doesn't mean that that Hoffa wasn't killed here. It just means somebody bled here recently, some man bled here recent, a little bit recently enough to have detectable DNA. Right, right. Um, and they're continuing to look at possible future tests to see if they can find any, any of Hoffa's DNA. Um, but fundamentally, I think that, um, I think this is right. I think mm. Sheeran's telling the truth. 
he may not be telling the truth on absolutely everything, but I I think I mean he was one of the people that the FBI singled out as we think he's involved, and he's made a deathbed confession with regret and um and with details of the house that have subsequently been verified, and to me I think his claim is fundamentally credible. Okay. Um, now if that's given, it then means you got to look at some other claims that he made in the book. Because there's long been rumored mafia connections to all kinds of things in American politics. And um, one of the things that Hoffa claims, or that Sheeran claims, is that he was ordered, because he's a trucker, right, or early in his career, mm -hmm. back in the early 60s, um, he was ordered to deliver guns to David Ferry for the Bay of Pigs invasion right. that, that Kennedy went along with at the beginning of his term. David Ferry is a figure who then figured prominently in um, the investigation of the uh, JFK assassination that was conducted by the New Orleans district attorney, Jim Garrison. So Ferry is, and Ferry is also, according to um, the the Garrison investigation was also involved in the Bay of Pigs. So it's one of the reasons he hated Kennedy is Kennedy didn't follow through on the air support the CIA believed he was going to offer for the invasion, right. caused, thus let it fail. There's long been uh, rumors that the CIA, and it might be more than rumors, that the CIA worked with the mob to support the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was Cuban right. expatriates invading Cuba to overthrow Castro. Right. And and that that's where they got like some weapons and things for those uh, for those uh, Cuban exiles. Right. And the and, mob, the mob, I'm sorry, the mob was interested in overthrowing Castro because they had many financial casinos. interests in Havana. Yeah. Yeah. They had all kinds of casinos. It used to be Havana used to be a, a pleasure town like Las Vegas yeah. until Castro came in and closed down all their businesses. So the mob hated Castro and wanted him overthrown. Right. So there's kind of a natural alliance there. And according to Sheeran. He was ordered to deliver guns to David Ferry for the Bay of Pigs invasion. Gotcha. He also said he was, a couple of years later, ordered to deliver guns to Ferry again for the JFK assassination, which had Mob and Jimmy Hoffa involvement, hmm. which is another very popular theory about the JFK uh, invasion. Uh, he also assassination sorry <laughs> um he well, it was a kind of invasion you know with the bullets <laughs> yes um but uh he also then claims that various nixon officials including um including john john mitchell the former attorney general were involved in some of these behind the scenes things like i believe there's a if i remember it correctly there's a place where john mitchell comes to deliver a warning like telling jimmy he needs to back off and um, and he wanted to get this warning to Jimmy that he needs to back off what he's claiming about, you know, retaking the Teamsters leadership and exposing mob ties. Um, so there's in, in any event a claim that that uh, Nixon officials like like John Mitchell were involved in that. Mm -hmm. What to make of these auxiliary claims? I don't know. They're possible, but I don't know what to make of them. I do think, though that um that his fundamental claim about he's the one that killed Hoffa is okay. accurate. So uh, as always we we take a look at the reason perspective and then a faith perspective. Um is there much to say from a faith perspective on this mystery? Well obviously we want to pray for uh the soul of Jimmy Hoffa and all of the souls of everybody who is involved, uh both the perpetrators and mm -hmm. the victims of all these crimes. Um it's never too late to pray for anybody. And um, one positive thing to note is that before he died, Frank Sheeran, who was Irish and Catholic, but had not lived as a Catholic for many, many years, he came back to the sacraments. He, he went to confession more than once and, and was absolved. And it's clear when in reading uh, I Heard You Paint Houses that he was very gratified by the fact that he'd had his sins forgiven in confession. So... Let's hope he made a good confession and that he was indeed wow, forgiven. That's amazing. Um, so uh, that is so, and I think you've you've already given us your bottom line, which is you, you believe um, Sheeran's claims about Hoffa, um, mm -hmm. and 
others others hard to know, especially because of the compartmentalization right. that's involved. Right. You know, you were told bring these guns to this guy, and you infer that they were used in the Beijing right. invasion. Right. So okay, yeah. and 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 as far as where Jimmy's body ended up, that is also still. A mystery. Yeah, according to according to Sheeran, it was cremated, and that's why it hasn't been found. And but the, again, that due to compartmentalization, even those claims are are still open. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, what kind of resources can we offer the listeners to who want to find out more about this? Well, one thing to look out for is an upcoming movie that Martin Scorsese is making for mm. Netflix um, about all of this. It's based on "I Heard You Paint Houses." Uh, there's been some dispute about what the title of it is going to be, but it's going to star Robert De Niro and Al Pacino and Joe Pesci. Mm. So all of those mob <laughs> actors, you know, that are famous from other roles. I mean, not that they're in the mob, but they portray mob figures yes. on as prominent roles. So wh- which one is Hoffa? Because um, they could all be Hoffa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I forget. It, I, I believe it actually has okay. been announced, but I I'll forget have to look it up. who it is. Um, uh, so keep an eye out for the upcoming Martin Scorsese film. Um, the key thing to read to get this account is the book, I Heard You Paint Houses by Charles Brandt, and we'll have a link to that. Also, uh, I have uh, links to online resources uh, that you can just look at for free. Uh, one of them is Wikipedia's article on Jimmy Hoffa. Another is Wikipedia's article on Frank Sheeran. Okay. He has his own Wikipedia page. Uh, I've got a link to the FBI Hoffex memo which does name um, uh, Frank Sheeran as one of the key suspects, along with several other people that figure prominently in the story. And I also have uh, videos on a video on YouTube. It's actually a series that have been stitched together where Frank Sheeran does confess on camera. So you can watch that. uh, On the Scorsese movie, it's called The Irishman. Well, that's the dis- that's one of the disputed uh, things uh, that some have claimed it's called oh, the okay. Irishman, others have oh, claimed okay. it's not. So, uh, De Niro is Frank Sheeran, um, Al Pacino is Hoffa, and Joe Pesci is uh, Russell Bufalino. So, and uh, they also have Jesse uh, Plemons playing um, Chucky O'Brien. There's there's a there's a <laughs> it's the who's who of mob movie actors in this. So yeah, this actually yeah. looks like it's going to be pretty good. Yeah. All the I good mean, even Ray Romano is in this, so it'll be, uh, this, oh, everybody, everybody loves Ray. Raymond. So, uh, so that'll be good. Ha, Jimmy, did you, have you ever seen the 1992 Hoffa movie directed by Danny DeVito starring Jack Nicholson? Okay. I have not. That would be interesting. Yeah, apparently the, 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 the conclusion from that movie, because that of course predates, uh, Sheeran's revelations, um, is that, there was a mob hit in the parking lot of the restaurant, the red, the red box, um, by mm-hmm. a teamster driver, but not named uh-huh. and, and not, you, you know, not in the compartmentalization stuff, uh, which year and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, uh, so I get, I gather that, that that's how the, that movie concluded. I haven't seen it myself, but, uh, it might be worthwhile to go check on it. It was d- mm-hmm. uh, directed by Danny DeVito, which is a uh, fascinating, um, so yeah. maybe people check that out. Excellent. He's Italian. He's Italian. He knows wherever he speaks. So uh, let's move on. to. So that concludes our discussion of Jimmy Hoffa. So let's move on to our mysterious feedback. Um, on our episode, we t- just before Christmas, we talked about when was Jesus born. Uh, we had a comment from uh, James Colin on YouTube who said, a former girlfriend of mine was born in northern Iraq in 1968. Her birthday was December 30th, but that was simply the date that, that the family registered her birth with the state, i.e. the date on her birth certificate. She did not know her actual birthday, but they celebrated it on that day. I suppose her parents would have remembered the exact date, but apparently it wasn't that important. And I gather that's in response right, so, to something you had said. Right. In in the in the uh, episode on when Jesus was born, I mentioned an argument that some people make. Oh, of course, you know, Mary would have known exactly when Jesus was born. Birthdays would be remembered and passed on to other people. So, of course, the memory of the exact day would have been passed on. And actually, that that's that's an argument that works in our culture, where birthdays are important and are celebrated. But in other cultures, it's not always that way, including in Middle Eastern cultures. Frequently, people will have only a kind of vague idea like, yeah, I was born in the spring, I think, but I don't know really when or even necessarily what exact year. So we have a culture that is highly 
focused on numeracy mm -hmm. on on recording numerical things like times but other cultures not nearly that way some cultures in fact really do have counting systems that go one to right. many there's no no way they're remembering a birthday in right culture. okay so uh eric from the twin cities in minnesota says uh i really enjoyed this episode especially the part discussing birthdays and the lack of celebration by common people of that region around the time of jesus over the past several years this is a subject i've given some thought to after i had an encounter with a jehovah's witness who told me that celebrating birthdays is immoral, citing that the only birthdays mentioned in the Bible were of evil people and involved immoral things. I didn't know that it wasn't a custom to celebrate birthdays at that time for the average person. I just thought it, the claims were correct, that birthdays just weren't important enough to mention in a gospel. I'm interested in hearing a follow-up to Jimmy's comments on this. If early Christians didn't celebrate birthdays, is there something to this practice? Should we stop celebrating birthdays? Also, don't the Orthodox Church celebrate Christmas on or around the Epiphany? Because that's December 25th on the Julian calendar, which predates the Gregorian calendar. Um, and you didn't recall you mentioning this in the episode. Yeah, so let's deal with the second question first. Um, Orthodox uh, Christians do typically celebrate Jesus' birth on December 25th as reckoned by the Julian calendar. Um, which is out of sync with the Gregorian calendar because it doesn't measure the year as accurate. So over the, course, the the way the Julian calendar works, it assumes that the year is exactly 365.25 days long. And the year is really 365.2422 days long. And so over the course of centuries, that led to a discrepancy developing between the calendar dates on the Julian calendar and the seasons. And to correct that, back in the 1500s, uh, Pope Gregory introduced what's called the Gregorian calendar, which readjusted things and is will keep the dates in sync with the seasons for thousands of years. Uh, but in because it was a Catholic pope who did that, um, non-Catholic places didn't immediately adopt the, the Gregorian calendar, uh, including England. England kept the Julian calendar for a while. Eventually, the Gregorian calendar became universal in government and business, but it's still not used as the liturgical calendar in in like Russian Orthodox churches and so forth. So they still use the Julian calendar. They are, according to their calendar, celebrating on December 25th, but it is after um, December 25th on the Gregorian calendar. Okay. Okay. In terms of the other question... Um, it is it, it's true that it seems from the evidence we have that birthdays were not commonly celebrated by many early Christians. And you can listen to the episode for some discussion of that. Um, I quote the early Christian writer Origen, for example, on this point. But um, but it's not clear that the practice was universal. And in any event, it's not a matter of faith. There's there's no commandment that says you you must or must not celebrate birthdays. The argument that Jehovah's Witnesses make that these the few figures, uh, basically Pharaoh and um, and uh, one of the Herods, uh, the Herod who puts John the Baptist to death, that they both celebrated birthdays. That's a, that's a that's at best a extraordinarily weak inductive right. argument based on inference that just because they did bad things on their birthdays, well, a lot of people do bad things <laughs> on their birthdays. That doesn't mean that birthdays right. are bad. Um, and it's really, frankly, it's a hasty generalization. It commits the fallacy of hasty generalization. So there's nothing wrong with birthdays. Uh, some cultures celebrate them. Some cultures don't. Ours happens to, but we don't need to stress about it one way or another. It's just a cultural right. practice. And it, and it can be a way of honoring God for right. the gift of life, even though your real birthday is or your real gift of life day is your conception, but we don't have an easy way to measure that because it's not as obvious as when a baby comes <laughs> right. out of the womb. Well, that's why I always uh, wanted the church to rename the uh, the Feast of the Annunciation to the Feast of the Incarnation. Uh, I, I think that oh, would be a sure. wonderful uh, expression of that reality, but uh, that's my yeah. private uh, goal. <laughs> so, uh, but mm -hmm. thank you, Eric, for that uh, very interesting question. Uh, David Arcudi, sorry if I mispronounced that, from YouTube says, why is there no year zero? So there is a year zero on an astronomical calendar that uh, astronomers use because, um, you know, they need to do math on right. the, with the calendar in a, in a more rigorous way. And so 
they took essentially they took the Gregorian calendar and it's the same for the AD period. But then 1 BC becomes the year 0 and 2 BC becomes the year negative 1 and 3 BC becomes the year negative 2 and so forth. And that lets them do math yeah. easy. But on the Gregorian calendar that normal people use there is no year 0 because of the way because of the difference between cardinal and ordinal numbers. So if we uh, talk, we so like uh, if we talk about somebody's first year, that doesn't mean they're one year right. old. If someone's in their first year, that means they're between zero and twelve months old. Right. They become one when they complete their first year. And so the AD years, AD stands for Ano Domini, which is Latin for the year of our Lord. And so the year of our Lord, one, would in theory be Jesus's first year between when Jesus was just born and the time he turned 12 right. months old. The first year before that, or the first year before Christ, would therefore be the period of 12 months preceding that. And so, um, so th that's the general logic. You have Jesus's birth as a theoretical dividing line. It's not really there. Um, it's really it, sometime in three or two BC. But when the Gregorian calendar was set up, the calculations it was based on assumed Jesus is born at the end of one BC, and then. 1 AD is the first calendar year, the first year beginning in January after his birth, and 1 BC is the first year before that. So it's because first is different than one. And so you have the first year after the first year before and no okay. zero. Um, also, one of the reasons for that is zero was not yet used in Western mathematics at the time these calculations were right. made. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah, no one is ever actually zero except for that one moment when they were born. As soon as that moment passes, it's one second old, two seconds old. That's it. Yeah. Excellent. Do you need calculus to deal with infinitesimals? <laughs> so. And then uh, one more piece of feedback from Lil Zaza on iTunes in an iTunes review, for which we are so grateful to get iTunes reviews, uh, says, uh, he or she says, Jimmy has so much knowledge and presents it in an easy, clear style. Long-time listener and will donate to SQPN. Well, thank you, Lil Zaza. Thank you. Yeah, we really appreciate That's awesome. it. Awesome. Uh, we really we appreciate everyone who 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 supports our work, uh, no matter uh, of what size gift. That that's always uh, greatly appreciated. So, Jimmy, do you have some mysterious headlines for us this week? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, first of first off, uh, you may recall that last year a, there was a story in the news about an object in our solar system called Oumuamua. And they they are sure that this object, because of the trajectory it came in from and the speed at which it was moving, they're sure it's from outside our solar system. And it was thought at first to be just an asteroid. But then when it whipped around our sun, coming out the other side of the sun, it accelerated hmm. in a weird way that normally a comet might do, but it didn't have a comet's tail. And so it didn't behave either like an asteroid or a comet. And uh, some have proposed that it could be an alien probe and that maybe it accelerated because it deployed a light sail as it went around the sun. And, um, you know, that claim got out there. A scientific paper was written discussing it. The claim got out there. A lot of people piled on in the astronomical community and said, oh, no, it couldn't be that. Well, the um, the astronomer who made the claim has now doubled hmm. down on the claim and said uh, science is not a popularity contest. And these alternative explanations do not explain the data. And this hypothesis needs to be taken seriously. And I don't care if I'm committing reputational suicide by saying that, in essence. Um, so, uh, in fact, he said, what, what if they strip me of, what if my university strips me of my administrative duties? That just gives me more time to research. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so check out the article. We've got a little feisty discussion going on about whether we've had an alien space probe in our system. He also incidentally predicts that uh, if we get out of our system, we're going to find lots of things like this. 
because if and this is one of the this is one of the things we discuss in the uh, in the Fermi paradox episode. You know, if there are alien civilizations that are millions of years older than us, they should have sent out loads and load technological civilizations. They should have sent out probes to like every star in the galaxy. And uh, according to this astronomer, that's what Oumuamua may hmm. well be one of those things. And there should be lots of others. Okay. Keep, stay tuned, folks, for that. Because uh, they're always crazy until they're true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. The, uh, the other uh, mysterious headline I've got for this for us this time, you know, if you're looking to get away from it all, uh, there's a cruise been announced for the year 2020. That's the Flat Earth Cruise. So it's specifically for people who believe the Earth is flat. Uh, they're going to go cruising. Um, hopefully, they don't fall yeah, off. Don't the go edge. too far out. Yeah. Uh, but if, yeah, but if you do, it's your chance to get away from it all. <laughs> um, the uh, the don't necessarily expect the ship's crew to be on board, so to speak, with the flat Earth idea because they're using satellite navigation to make their way around the Earth as they cruise. Yeah. And if you've ever been on a cruise ship, you know they're like all driven by satellite GPS right. these days. They even have maps on the like on the wall of the ship with showing your current position based on satellite data. And um, so uh, one of the things it talks about in the article is uh, they interview a ship captain who kind of poo-poos the flat earth thing, says, look, I've been around the earth multiple times and it's definitely <laughs> round. Um, don't know any cruise ship captains who think otherwise. But even if the crew doesn't agree, you can go and be with some fellow flat earthers and have a good time. Certainly, relaxing. even before the advent of satellite navigation, uh, you know, ship navigators have relied on the the assumption that the Earth is a sphere in order to get from place right. to place. And, and and even before that, it's ironic because ship navigation was one of the original arguments for why the Earth is round. Because if you watch a ship sailing towards you, you see its mass appear yep. first as if it's coming up over a round hill rather than seeing the ship just vanish in the distance all at once as if it were going away and getting progressively smaller on a flat yeah. surface. Well, hopefully the folks will get a little education in uh, in the spherical navigation uh, on board. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, oh, and be before people ask, we will do a future episode on flat earth theory because I know that's yeah. a popular topic. So uh, before we wrap up, we uh, like we have started doing, we wanted to thank uh, our patrons who make it possible to bring you this show, um, all of our patrons. But today, especially, we want to thank y uh, Yvonne R., Dennis S., Todd H., Brian M., and Rosemary P. Uh, through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for us to continue to bring you Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows we do at sqpn.com, including some great new ones we've got so go check out the sqpn.com and see the, the new shows we've been uh, preparing. You can join them in supporting us by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What do you think about this uh, theory about the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa and the and, and the uh, the mystery uh, that seems to be solved, but maybe not? What do you think? What's your theory? Let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page. Leave us some feedback there. You can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com. You can send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. You, uh, and please share the podcast with your friends and write a review in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. That helps us grow our community of listeners and to reach more people with this great content. You can find the relevant links from our discussion and the links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks so much, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bethanelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.